It's Thursday, October 10th, and this is the Daily Medical News, where we bring you the top headlines in clinical medicine, plus a closer look at today's biggest story. I'm Terry Rudd. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Today, not enough pregnant women are getting both the Tdap vaccine and the flu vaccine. Reasonable expectations are essential in managing refractory rheumatoid arthritis. Why every patient with chronic pain should complete a fibromyalgia survey. And intensive cognitive training may be necessary to achieve memory gains in multiple sclerosis. Plus, a new guideline recommends skipping colorectal cancer screening in low-risk patients. A little over half of pregnant women get the Tdap vaccine during pregnancy or the influenza vaccine before or during pregnancy. But only 35% get both. That's according to a Morbidity and Mortality Weekly report published by the CDC. The CDC recommends that all pregnant women receive the Tdap vaccine, preferably between 27 and 36 weeks gestation. The flu vaccine is recommended for all women at any point in pregnancy if the pregnancy falls within flu season. Women don't need a second flu shot if they receive the vaccine before pregnancy in the same influenza season. Both vaccines provide protection to infants after birth. What's the key to boosting the rate of women receiving the shots? Provider recommendations. Immunization rates were higher among women whose clinicians recommended the vaccines. 66% subsequently received a flu shot and 71% received Tdap. About 10% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis have a difficult to treat RA, and managing those patients may come down to setting reasonable expectations and addressing practical concerns, such as medication adherence, comorbidities, and adverse drug reactions. That's the advice of Dr. Ian McInnes of the University of Glasgow and the current president of the European League Against Rheumatism. Speaking at the annual Perspectives in Rheumatic Diseases held by Global Academy for Medical Education, Dr. McGinnis noted that the definition of difficult-to-treat rheumatoid arthritis varies among experts, and the reasons for refractoriness are often unknown. For those with difficult-to-treat RA, Dr. McGinnis says it may be beneficial to go back to the beginning Even just the opportunity to go through the disease course is reassuring for patients. Consider the possible presence of anti-drug antibodies, and keep in mind that medication adherence may be a problem. Dr. McGinnis says about one-third of patients who are prescribed methotrexate don't take the medication. Global Academy for Medical Education and this news organization are owned by the same parent company. A fibromyalgia survey may provide important information about the degree to which patients with rheumatic disease experience centralized pain, and it can help set the right treatment path for individual patients. Dr. Daniel Clough directs the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Speaking at the annual Perspectives in Rheumatic Diseases held by Global Academy for Medical Education, he outlined his use of a patient self-report survey for the assessment of fibromyalgia. That survey asks patients to report where they experience pain throughout the body, as well as symptoms such as fatigue, sleep problems, and memory problems. Dr. Klaus says the survey predicts outcomes of surgery for osteoarthritis better than x-rays, MRI scans, or psychological factors. Physicians should ask every patient with chronic pain to complete the survey, including patients with osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or lupus. Dr. Klaus says the resulting score will tell you the degree to which a patient's central nervous system is augmenting or amplifying what's going on in their body. The higher their score is, he explains, the more you should treat them like you would someone with fibromyalgia, even if their underlying disease might be an autoimmune disease. Global Academy for Medical Education and this news organization are owned by the same parent company. We'll be back with more medical news after this message. Cognitive rehabilitation to address memory deficits in multiple sclerosis 
can take a page from efforts to help those with other conditions. But practitioners and patients should realize that more intensive interventions are likely to be of greater benefit in MS. Piet Bowman is a doctoral student at Amsterdam University Medical Centers. He and his colleagues conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of 82 studies to determine which memory interventions in current use most help hippocampal memory functioning. Mr. Bowman presented the findings at the annual Congress of the European Committee for Treatment and Research in Multiple Sclerosis. Individuals representing the healthy aging population saw the most benefit from interventions to address memory loss. Patients with mild cognitive impairment saw a slightly lower benefit, followed by patients with Alzheimer's disease. Patients with MS, however, lagged far behind in their response to interventions to improve memory. Exercise interventions showed moderate effectiveness. By contrast, high-intensity cognitive training working on memory strategies was the most effective intervention. Among the varying conditions associated with hippocampal memory loss, MS-related memory problems saw the least response to intervention. The researchers note that might be a result of a more widespread pattern of cognitive decline in MS. Patients 50 to 79 years old with a demonstrably low risk of developing colorectal cancer within 15 years probably don't need to be screened. But if their risk of disease is at least 3% over 15 years, patients should be screened. Those are the recommendations from a clinical practice guideline created by a 22-member international panel that developed as part of the BMJ Rapid Recommendations Project. For patients who aren't low risk, the panel suggests screening with one of four options, fecal immunochemical test every year or every two years, a single sigmoidoscopy, or a single colonoscopy. The panel's review of available research showed that compared with no screening, all four of those screening models reduced the risk of colorectal cancer mortality to a similar level. The guideline authors caution, however, that successfully implementing the recommendations depends on accurate risk assessment. The team recommends the Q-Cancer platform as one of the best performing models for both men and women. That calculator includes factors such as age, sex, smoking status, alcohol use, family history of gastrointestinal cancer, and personal history of other cancers. The panel stressed that its recommendations can't be applied to all patients. Evidence for both screening recommendations was weak largely because of the dearth of supporting data. So, patients and physicians should work together to create a personalized screening plan. For a closer look at the guideline, click the link in the podcast notes. And that's it for today's daily medical news. Remember to listen to the latest episodes of the Dermatology Weekly and Blood and Cancer podcasts, available today and every Thursday. For MD Edge, I'm Terry Rudd. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Thanks for listening.